Welcome back to COVID-313 Coalition for Families and Students. We are so excited to be with you again on another Thursday. I'm Christine Bell, Executive Director of UNI and a really proud member of this coalition, but most importantly, a mom of three really amazing children. Um, we are so excited for our program today, and we're excited to, that you're with us. Um, but first, we want to uh, make sure that, that uh, we get everybody to the right place. So first and foremost, we want to make sure that you know that we want to hear from you. This is a two-way conversation, so you can chat your comments or questions in Facebook. Um, you can also text message your questions to 313 288-2082. And we have Brooke and Lindsay that are, are waiting and I think Ophelia that are that are standing by to take your questions and your comments so that we can ask experts um, the questions that you have. So just to make sure that they're listening, why don't you tell us um, where you're joining us from today? Um, and uh, so drop that in the chat, or you can text it to 313-288-2082. And like always, we're translating the town hall to Spanish and ASL. So Ophelia, could you please give us the details on how to listen to the Spanish interpretation? I do not see Ophelia, so let's go to Julie. Thank you for being with us again, Julie. Um, could you please provide the instructions for ASL? Thank you so much, Julie. Ophelia, you're on. Could you please share the details on how to hear Spanish interpretation? Yes, sorry, it was disconnected. Uh, but escuchar este video okay. en español, por favor, búscanos en Detroit Hispanic Development Corporation. Vamos a estar en vivo ahorita haciendo la traducción para ustedes. Este, entonces, en DHDC. Este, gracias por estar con nosotros. La, la traducción hoy sería hecha para la doña uh, Gloria Rosas y yo, Felia Torres. Thank you so much, Ophelia, and thank you, Gloria, for, for providing the Spanish interpretation today. Stay with us for the next 60 minutes so that you can stay informed and be empowered. We have a collection of experts to share their expertise in a variety of areas and answer some common questions, but also to answer your questions. So again, please use the Facebook chat or you can text your questions or comments to 313-288-2082. We'll have question and answer section after most segments. If we can't answer your question today, we're committed to getting you the answers by early next week. All questions asked today will be posted with answers on OneDetroitPBS.org. For our experts, please remember to speak slowly for our translators. They want to make sure that they're translating the important information that you are sharing correctly. Please turn off your cameras when you're not speaking to ensure that our ASL interpreter can be seen and mute yourself when you're not speaking. Terry Whitfield is back from his fabulous vacation in Florida and he is our timekeeper. So please keep your eye out for the chat in, at, for, in the chat. He'll rem, remind you what your remaining time is. And if you go over your time, myself or Jametta will gently remind you to wrap and so for the last, uh, you know, couple of weeks, we have been honoring teachers and the amazing work that they all do always. 
but teachers have been real heroes um, in this last year. So Brooke is here to bring us our, our teacher appreciation segment. Hi. <clears throat> so yes, Hi. my name is Brooke. <laughs> I'm from Yoon. I and I'm here to um, wrap up the teacher appreciation. Um, for the last couple of weeks, we've been honoring teachers throughout Detroit. You know, who have had a positive impact, especially now throughout COVID. So let's get started. First up, we have Mr. Gavin Buckley from Henry Ford High School. He was nominated by Don Wilson Clark. Her reasoning for nominating Mr. Buckley is, Mr. Buckley is an amazing educator inside the school and the community. We appreciate his love and support for the children in our city. So shout out to Mr. Buckley. As we mentioned earlier, all of, our, all of the teachers who've been nominated will receive a little token of gratitude from us. Up next, we have Mrs. Pellish Fritches. Sorry if I'm butchering your name. Um, she is from Legacy Academy and she was nominated by Christina Wilson. Um, her reasoning is she makes sure she takes time with each student to ensure that they understand and are learning. She goes out of her way for her students and they adore her and the parents do too. So thank you to Ms. Pellish <laughs> um, for all the work that you do. Up next, we have we have Mr. Eddie Bark. Unfortunately, we do not have a picture of him, but he was nominated by Jerrica Minkins. His passion for building skilled, empowered children is unmatched. So shout out to Mr. Eddie Bart from Detroit Community School. Up next, we have Ms. Lawanda Hood Craggett from Mission City. She was nominated by Jerrica Minkins. Her reasoning is that her love and dedication to our children is priceless. So thank you to Ms. Craggett for all the hard work that you do. Up next, we have Ms. Kelsey Willie from Cass Tech High School. <clears throat> she was nominated by Lindsay. Her reasoning is, I know Ken, <clears throat> Kensley best because of her work on the core team of My Students Dream, which is a group of educators, students, parents, and community members who organize at the intersection of immigration and education justice. Her work with <clears throat> My Students Dream exemplifies why she's such an amazing teacher. Kelsey knows that knows that she needs to be there for her students inside the classroom, as well as advocating for more equitable policies for students in larger educational systems as well. Kelsey's students describe Ms. Will, Ms. Willie at th as thoughtful, fun, creative, and supportive. She goes above and beyond and deserves so much more than this nomination. We love and appreciate all that you do, um, Ms. Kelsey. So shout out to her and all of the great things she does for our students. Up next, we have <clears throat> Up next, we have Ms. Heidi Golds. She is from Roberto Clemente and she was nominated by Maria Moreno. Uh, Maria's reasoning for nominating Ms. Golds is because she's a really good teacher. She teaches very well and is an awesome with her students. So shout out to Ms. Golds. Up next, we have looks like we're at the end of it. So thank you to all of our amazing teachers, those who are nominated and those who are, because we're sure there's many more great teachers out there. Um, thank you for all the hard work that you guys continue to do day after day. And, you know, thank you for impacting the lives of many students, you know, for years prior and you, years to come. So thank you. And up next, we will have, um, sorry, oops, up back to you, Christine. Thanks, Brooke. Thank you. Um, so those teachers, 
are, are very inspiring. And we know that there are so many more teachers out there that, that do wonderful, amazing work every day. And we want to, we want to honor and thank all of you. So today we have four really important topics that we're covering. We're going to have updates from the state. Um, and let me just make sure that I am in the right place here. So we are going to have, uh, sorry, excuse me, we're going to have an update from the Detroit Health Department. So Hannah will be here with us today. We'll be talking with our schools about, and, and um, Wayne Risa about what is, what is to come in the, the next school year and throughout the summer. And then, um, and then we are going to be closing out. So we have got, I, not four, two really important topics. So, um, up first, we have Hannah from the health department. Hannah. Good afternoon. I'm going to share my screen. Oh, I think I need, uh, I need the ability to share first. So my name is Hannah Ewing. I'm one of the education and outreach nurses with the city of Detroit health department and we're going to do our weekly COVID-19 update, as well as provide some more information on the recent changes in wearing masks around the city, whether you're outside or in businesses. See if I can still wait to get the ability to share my slides. All right, I can just talk through everything as well, and then we'll have some more time for conversation and questions. So what's going on in the city of Detroit currently is that we're seeing our COVID positivity rates decline, which is really exciting. We're almost down to that 3% goal, which is where we see that 3% of community spread being lower. So you're less likely to get it when you're in the community. Looks like I can share now. So I'll show you guys the awesome numbers as we continue to trend down. All right, here is the city of Detroit now. So we're at 4.5%. The state of Michigan is at 4.2%. We see Oakland County to the north at 3.1%. So they're almost at that under the community spread threshold. Washington County has made it at 1.2%, which is a great number to see. And it made me really happy when I looked at the numbers this morning. As of 6-2-2021, we've had over 51,030 confirmed COVID-19 cases, and we've had over 2,200 confirmed deaths. Thankfully, we are seeing these numbers, or the death rate decrease over time, so we're headed in the right direction. So one of the reasons that these numbers are going down is the vaccinations available to our community. The city of Detroit still lags behind at 34.8% of all people eligible, so 12 and older, who have received at least one vaccine dose. If you look at Oakland County, they're currently at 63.6%. Washington County is at 63.6% as well. And the city of Detroit is also lagging behind the state of Michigan, which has a vaccination rate of 53.8%. Looking at the city of Detroit's vaccination efforts, we've administered 335,000 vaccines at just over 80% of our total supply. We have about 4,000 future doses scheduled, which means that people have made appointments, but we also see a lot of walk-in availability throughout the city as well. So you do not have to make an appointment to get vaccinated. We've received over 400,000 doses of the vaccines and there's a brief breakdown of which types of vaccines we are giving. We also wanna make sure that we are being transparent in who we're giving the vaccine to, to make sure that it is equitable and accessible to all Detroit residents. So we continue to update our page with our uh, racial breakdown, as well as the different employment sectors to make sure that we are giving the vaccine equitably to the city of Detroit. And just a little bit of science to talk about why it's so important to get vaccinated is let's talk about what happens with and without a vaccine and why these vaccines are saving lives. So without a vaccine, your body is exposed to COVID-19. You then develop symptoms and get sick. And with COVID-19, you can get extremely sick, end up in the hospital or pass it along to someone who could get sick, very sick as well. And then you develop antibodies. 
And when you develop antibodies from a naturally acquired COVID-19 infection, the science is showing that those antibody levels decrease over time and are less effective than the, the vaccine acquired antibodies. The good thing about the vaccine is that you're exposed to a vaccine version of the germ. Your body develops, gets to bypass developing symptoms and get sick, and you get to develop antibodies. The great thing about this is that you don't have to worry about having long-term symptoms of COVID-19, which we're seeing in about 10 to 30% of our population. And I unfortunately was one of those people. So I encourage you to get, if you have questions about the vaccine, reach out to us. We have a wonderful team of educators to answer any questions by phone, email, or set up a one-on-one -on -one vaccine education session with you or any community group you belong to. So let's talk about once fully vaccinated, what you can do. And then we're going to jump in into the new guidelines for the state of Michigan that the city of Detroit is following. So once fully vaccinated, you can visit inside a home or a private setting with, that, with other fully vaccinated people. You can visit inside a home or a private setting without a mask with other unvaccinated households who are not at risk for severe illness. You can also travel domestically without pre or post test travel. You can travel domestically without quarantining. So if you arrive back in Detroit, you don't have to worry about staying home for 14 days. Um, you do not have to quarantine if you are exposed to someone who had COVID-19. We ask that you maintain body awareness. And if you start to feel sick, you then quarantine yourself um, and let others that you may have exposed know as well. And you can gather a conduct activities outdoors without wearing a mask, except in certain crowded settings and venues. And that's actually recently changed. So what does fully vaccinated mean? So fully vaccinated means that it's two weeks after your second dose of a two dose series like the Pfizer or the Moderna vaccine. We also have for the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, which is that single dose, it's two weeks after your single dose of your Johnson & Johnson vaccine. And so let's give some updates about mask and capacity in the state of Michigan, which the city of Detroit is following, unless the business decides to change their rules because they have the ability to enforce stricter rules in their businesses and facilities. So as of June 1st, there will no longer be capacity limits outdoors. There will also no longer be capacity limits at residential gatherings. Additionally, um, Indoor establishments will be at 50% capacity. This is an increase of capacity from 25%. And that the social gatherings, they are at the jurisdiction of the venue. So for example, a wedding venue or a conference setting would set its own limits. And face masks continue to be required for non-vaccinated individuals indoors. This is to keep, if you're unvaccinated, those around you safe, as well as keep you safe from getting the infection yourself. And as I mentioned before, businesses can still require as individuals to wear a mask while in their facility. As I've mentioned in the past, it's really important to think about who is behind the register or who is you're interacting with at the store because we don't know their own story. They may be a high risk individual working the front line this whole pandemic, and they're still terrified of this virus because they've seen the impact it has in our community. So bring the accessory of summer 2021 with you, bring your mask, mask with you to any activity because you may be asked to wear this. And if you would like to get vaccinated, you can always give us a call at the health department through our TCF center at 313-230-0505, Monday through Friday from 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. To make an appointment, you can choose prompt one for the vaccine option. Prompt two will get you to the COVID-19 testing line as well. So if you wanna get tested, prompt two. Um, they will ask you a couple pieces of information like your name, address, date of birth, phone number, email, and if you've ever had a previous allergic reaction to a vaccine. If you've had an allergic reaction to a vaccine, it's very important that you tell them, but will not preclude you from getting the vaccine unless you've had an allergic reaction to a COVID-19 vaccine. And then we ask that you have a conversation with your healthcare provider, like your nurse practitioner or your doctor. Um, if you're getting a two series vaccines, you will be given two different appointment dates and they will be sending reminders via email or text message. 
And we have a couple new vaccination rules for minors. So any individual aged 12 to 17 must be accompanied by a parent or guardian. The parent or guardian must show the ID and they also must fill out a written consent form. It's also another reminder that there is no good neighbor reimbursement for anyone under the age of 18 to be vaccinated. And so the COVID-19 vaccines are just a piece of the puzzle that will help us get back to normal. If you choose that the vaccine is not right for you, your family, there are lots of other ways to make sure that you are staying safe from COVID-19, which means continuing wearing your mask in crowded places um, and when with others who haven't been vaccinated, washing your hands and practicing good hand hygiene, eating a well-balanced diet, and just watching and monitoring yourself for symptoms. If you have any questions or want more information about the COVID-19 vaccine or any of the recent mask or capacity updates, feel free to reach us at the health department. We have lots of different ways. Email us at dhdoutbreak at detroitmi.gov. Call us at 313-876-4000 for a wide variety of menus and options. And then if you are someone who is homebound or know someone who is homebound and would like to get vaccinated, you can always give the Detroit Area Agency on Aging a call to schedule a in-person in-home appointment at 313-446-4444. And that's all we have for you today. Thank you so much, Hannah. What wonderful information. Um, we have a question uh, that says, has there been any talks about booster shots? So could what, what do we know about the potential of needing a booster for the vaccine? So like our flu vaccine every year, there always is a potential. We wanna make sure that we are keeping up with whatever the flu is doing. Um, it's a virus, so it naturally mutates. The best way that we can avoid having a flu shot or a, a COVID booster is for everyone to get vaccinated. So we don't give COVID-19 a chance more variants and the variants is what the booster is going to help protect us from. So it is a possibility, but there is no FDA um, emergency use authorized booster shot yet. I know they are doing some studies though. So that's something to look out for. Great. Um, what is the health department's recommendation around cleaning? That's a great question. So we're still recommending all the COVID-19 cleaning practices stay in place. This means having hand sanitizer available to all customers um, using FDA approved. There's a list you can look at that has all the things that will kill COVID-19. It's not like a super virus. It, it you know, dies with soap and water, which is why hand washing is super important. So just make sure you're cleaning with your regular cleaning products. And if you have questions about specific cleaners, you can always reach our environmental health team by calling the 313-876-4000 number and they will work with your facility to make sure that you're cleaning in a proper way that keeps your staff and your patrons safe as well. How long are you planning on keeping the neighborhood sites operating for vaccinations? There is no plan to shut them down. I think it's even going in the other direction where we continue to expand. We have two mobile vans going around now, so you'll be seeing us driving around in the communities in the summer. And if you want a vaccine center in your neighborhood, we have a portal online, or you can email us at dhdoutbreak at detroitmi.gov, and we will bring the vaccine to you. Awesome. That's really good to know. Is the city going to be doing an immunization fair? And then I think, would the COVID vaccine be offered there, if that's something the city is planning on doing? I don't know of any plans, but if I hear of anything, I will let you guys know ASAP. Awesome. Um, and then what are your and MDHS's recommendations for organizations reopening? Um, I think with the lifting of the restrictions, I feel like there's more conversation about, you know, is it time now to go back? Um, and truth be told, it feels a little bit soon. <laughs> so. <laughs> Um, particularly with our with our numbers, but what are your recommendations for that? I'd say reach out or, to not yours, Hannah. <laughs> what are the health departments? I want to make make sure clarity. 
what are the yeah. health department and MDHHS's recommendations for organizations reopening? So I'd reach out if you want to help with your re reopening plan, reach out to us at the health department. The MyOSHA is also a wonderful resource. I know our, our environmental health team works really close with them and they do a fantastic job in communicating. So they'll probably also direct you to MyOSHA as well to make sure that you're following all the safety guidelines and we're having a safe reopening. Great. What have been your recommendations for opening pools, splash pads? You talked a little bit about weather, weddings and, you know, but schools and let's start with pools, all the summer fun. Pools or uh, splash pads and pools. What sort of recommendations do you all have for that? So the good news is, is that pools and splash pads are usually outside and outdoors is the safest place to be with COVID-19 because of the ventilation. The CDC guidelines change that we don't have to wear a mask outside, but if you are worried, you can always wear a mask with you. And if you're going to a place where there's lots of, lots of high touch surfaces, like a public pool or something, teach good hand washing practices because you can still touch it. Tell your little ones not to put their hands in their mouth. I know that's really hard <laughs> as a former preschool teacher, um, but model those good behaviors for them. You know, maybe have a pod that they go to the pool with so they're not interacting with a lot of families and things like that and just have a good conversation line. So if someone does develop COVID-19 mm -hmm. system symptoms, you can give them a call and let them know so that we can get people quarantined and stop the spread within our little pods and within our community. Um, and so I think Hannah, it, it sounds like they're, they're, the health department is still recommending some of the, um, not rest, I don't wanna use the word restriction, but making sure that you're, you're conscious about how many people you're interacting with um, and and to and to make sure that you're still we're still thinking about that that that's still we're, it's still something we're thinking about because pre-pandemic you didn't think about families you know you went to this person's house or that person's house and there wasn't a whole lot of thought about who was going to be there that has definitely changed over the pandemic so it sounds like is that still something we should be thinking about as parents absolutely COVID's still very much a threat to our communities especially with the vaccine not being available for those 11 and under, our little ones don't have that ability to get protected if that's something you want as a parent. It's coming down the line, but you know they still need to wear a mask when inside because they can't be fully vaccinated, unfortunately. So you know just make sure you're in good conversation with whoever's around you. Teach them good, you know, good manners. You guys are the best teachers as parents. You know, wash your hands a little bit extra long, you know, makes it make it fun and you know it will help them in the future too they're going to get less colds when they have these really good habits moving forward i will say masks have been a lifesaver for my son who loves to put his hand like he just he love he like puts his hands in his mouth all the time so they've been great it's mm -hmm. been great for that um so we have somebody that has asked when are the detroit recreation centers going to open I'm still in contact with our rec department. I think they're a little bit busy right now. So the answer is coming. Um, I reached out last week. So hopefully next week I'll have an answer. Okay, great. Um, and so um, we have two more minutes left. So what um, what is the health department's recommendation still in the same vein of summer fun, but weddings, social gatherings, family reunions, graduations? What are your, what are the, the health department's recommendations recommendations around those types of events? This, the safest place to have those events is outside. I myself am getting married in September and it will be outside. Math will be, you know, to the, if you're vaccinated, you're welcome to, but if you're not vaccinated, you know, and you're in close contact with a lot of people, you're increasing the risk for that. So outdoor is best. The weather is beautiful right now. So enjoy it, get some sunshine you know, have a little bit of normalcy, but still be on high alert to make sure that you're keeping yourself and your family safe. Great. Um, so congratulations, Hannah, you just dropped uh, some exclusive news <laughs> that you are, that you're getting, well, maybe, maybe we're the last to know, actually, probably, <laughs> but congr <laughs> congrats. <laughs> 
<laughs> it's, it's the third wedding of COVID. So, you know, th this one, my yeah. dad said it's going to happen this time. So, you know, but we're yeah. still taking everything very seriously. I'm using a lot of the knowledge we have at the health department to make sure that I keep those nearest and dearest to my heart safe, which is what we recommend everyone to do. So just stay vigilant, wear your mask if you're not fully vaccinated and you're going, you know, keep washing your hands and, you know, staying safe. Great, Hannah, well, congratulations. Maybe you could do like a YouTube video on how you planned your wedding in COVID. <laughs> and um at maybe that might that I feel like that would get a lot of views um so congratulations and I am going to turn it over to Jametta thank you Hannah for being with us thank you guys and and also let me uh repeat congratulations Hannah thank um, you. <laughs> we are delighted for you and I can imagine that for many couples that are getting married at this time period, uh, uh, whether it was in 2020 or now in 2021, uh, it will be historic because you'll be able to say, uh, hopefully to your grands and great grandchildren, uh, remember when we got married, there was a pandemic and I helped to make a difference during that time period. So Hannah, really appreciate you. And so as we think about uh, the people that are so essential to help us make a difference during this time period, uh, it's absolutely consistent that just as uh, Brooke did earlier, is our focus in on uh, some of our other heroes during this time period. And that's none other than our teachers, but also behind the scenes. And I think sometimes community, we forget that that we indeed have administrators who have had a, a huge job uh, throughout this time period, trying to plan, trying to be responsive, trying to be caring, and at the same time assure safety, and that our children have the opportunity to learn in spite of the pandemic. So we're really pleased to have on the program today an opportunity to do a little bit of a deep dive, uh, both with, with two of our outstanding educators in, in Wayne County. Uh, first is going to be joining us is Ironetta Wright. Ironetta is the Deputy Superintendent of the Detroit Public Schools Community District. Welcome, Ironetta. And Hello, also how are you? Joy Great. And also joining us, and we're particularly pleased, is to have Randy Lipa. Randy is the superintendent for the Wayne County Regional Educational Services Administration. And some of our families don't know that the way that our funds get distributed, they come from the feds to the state, and then from the Michigan Department of Education to what are called our local education administrations. And it so happens that Randy Lipa has been heading up the largest one in the state of Michigan. Uh, so both of you with uh, the largest school district, the largest regional educational services administration, you've had a lot on your shoulders and we salute you just as we salute the teachers. So let's get ready to dive in. Uh, what we'd like to do with the, the, the two of you is, is have a conversation uh, over the next 15 minutes and families that are listening, uh, we'd love for you to put your questions in the chat. Um, you can also text some of the members of the COVID-313 coalition so we can have a conversation. So for both of you, uh, why don't we start off with what do you want parents and families to know right now. And Ironetta, why don't we start with you and then Randy, if you'd answer the same question. What's important that you believe for people to know right now? That is a loaded question because yes. there's so much <laughs> um, that I want families to know. I, I first want families to know that in DPSCD, we are excited to welcome our students back to school buildings. Um, we went back to face-to-face um, um, -face learning on, on May the 24th, and we have students that are reporting to our schools daily, and we have more and more teachers that are also reporting face-to-face -face for our students. I think I also want families to know that we are still adhering to our safety protocols and our safety standards. So as I was hearing the other uh, young lady that was talking about uh, getting tested and vaccinations, that's something that we're really supporting in our district. We have initiated and launched a Teens for Vaccines initiative where our students have really um, shown their voice and their leadership around helping their peers understand the importance of the vaccination and being educated around the vaccination. But simultaneously, we do want to 
uh, have our parents know that we're still adhering to our safety precautions as we're moving forward and really uh, getting accustomed to the new normal um, through working through the pandemic. I also think I want our families to know that we are excited about our summer learning experiences, that we've launched um, a variety of partnerships with our, our community partners across the district, and we are opening our doors for families to come in, whether they're in our district or whether they sign up for the district for the fall, we want the experience to be different. Uh, we want to give them both academic support and academic enrichment, but we also want to re-engage students and families in the fun of school. So our setup really is in the mornings, we're doing academic support and in the afternoon, in the afternoons, we have a variety of partners that will be offering camp-like activities. I think the fourth thing that I want families to know, and then I'll stop because Randy knows, Randy and I, we, we, we work together quite well, uh, and Randy knows that I'll just keep going around this topic, but I also want families uh, to know that their, um, the, the attendance of our students in the fall is really important. I want families to, to know that we are here to support their needs and their desires and their wants to re-engage. We're continuing to knock on doors. We're continuing to visit families. Uh, we're continuing to offer social emotional support. Uh, we're looking at the additional mental health services that are necessary to help us continue to move through and really heal from the pandemic. And I want families to know that we're here and available to offer that support in any way that we can. So I want them to continue to know that we are a partner in what we're doing. And we're a partner um, in moving forward and really being able to uh, readjust, to re-engage, to refocus so that we continue to move our students and our community forward. Uh, wonderful, Ironetta. Thank you. Uh, Randy, if you would, what is it that you really want to communicate right now to families? Well, thank you, Jametta, for inviting me today. And it's great to see my friend, Dr. Wright, a uh, superstar educator, uh, and uh, uh, know that uh, DPSCD and the families in Detroit are, uh, have a, a tireless advocate uh, in, in Ironetta Wright uh, working for them. And so I, I would just start by saying, first of all, stay in constant contact with your local school district. Look regularly for updates. Uh, this has been a remarkably fluid time for all of us. Uh, as uh, Dr. Wright knows, the rules change on a regular basis, almost weekly over this past year in regards to the requirements to keep students safe, to keep staff safe, and to provide an educational program for, for our students. And so I would want them to know that they need to really regularly check in with their schools and their school district to make sure that they're up to date on the latest information in regards to their child's education moving into the next weeks and into the next uh, school year. The second thing I would want them to know is that educators and their educators are working tirelessly to plan for programs for students over the next weeks and over the next months. And so uh, sometimes it feels like uh, because the times have been so fluid and, and the rules have changed uh, so regularly over the last year that sometimes it feels like school districts maybe are, are, are uh, you know, flying by the seat of their pants. And nothing could be, really nothing could be further from the truth. Uh, our school districts are planning every single day to make sure that the programs and services that they're putting in place for their children are the very best that they can be and that they've been well thought out. So know that your school districts are not taking a day off and they are working regularly to plan for what's coming next and again in the next weeks and in the next months for their local school uh, systems. I would reiterate a couple of things that Irenetta mentioned, which was safety is still a number one concern for all school districts and all schools. And so that is a high priority for them as they're planning for the future. And I would also uh, highlight that, uh, you know, we need to recognize our, our federal government and our, and our state governments for really stepping up and providing resources during this time. Uh, we were beyond scared a year ago that school districts were gonna take a significant level of funding hit as we went into a time where school districts actually needed more support to help their children. And the federal government and state government came through and has provided significant resources 
for their local communities to utilize for learning, learning recovery, for PPE and safety equipment, and for other uh, purposes uh, to help school districts. And so uh, at least for a short period of time here, we do have resources and we're thankful for that. And uh, know that school districts are planning very, very how, hard how best to utilize those resources moving forward. Thank you, and, and thank you both. You've uh, actually hit on some of the very questions that we have and that we'll kind of kind of go backwards. Uh, Randy, you, you, you provided something for us that's really important for our community to know. You're absolutely right. A year ago, we were all really concerned about deficits and not having enough money. And poverty districts, unfortunately, that Detroit is, we thought we were going to get slammed even more because there's been a lack of equity always in the distribution of funds, federal, state, and certainly to communities like Detroit. But uh, we now are in the process of looking at budgets and budget opportunities. Um, Irenetta, can you talk a little bit about your budgeting process and in what ways are you looking to utilize the opportunities that are part of the American Rescue uh, Plan and those funds? Yes, and I would definitely echo uh, what Randy shared. You know, um, coming up of, about on my 30th year in public education, I started when I was 12. Um, but this is and the first too. time. <laughs> <laughs> this is um, this is really the first time that I can think of in my career that the government at this level has really worked to try to right size um, districts that are truly challenged. Um, you know, when we think about uh, Detroit Public Schools Community District, we have about a billion dollars in relief funds that gives us an opportunity over the next couple of years to really do some things that need to be done for our, for our students and our community. Um, when we think about some of the capital improvements that we need, that we really have not had the funding to do, that we're, because a lot of the dollars that we receive are not earmarked for capital mm -hmm. improvements, mm -hmm. even though we have such a, a dire need for a capital improvement. We also have to remember um, our superintendent um, started last week um, engagement sessions with the community, with families, with, with our staff around our return to school in the fall, as well as um, our, our budgeting priorities for the funding that we have. And one of the things that we've shared is we have, you know, right now money is not an, is not a, a, is not an obstacle when it comes to the, the, the work that needs to be provided for students. So for example, we've increased, um, we've increased the mental health support services for students. We've moved to um, uh, making certain that we have a nurse in each one of our schools and increasing oh, that. Excellent. We're looking to increase the academic uh, support that's provided to students through the use of academic interventionists or through retired teachers coming in to provide additional support to students. But we've also used uh, many of those dollars to support um, the programming that we're doing for students. So not only the additional mental health support programming, but the summer learning experiences where we are partnering with, with uh, organizations across the city um, in our school buildings, as well as we were able to, with, the, with this funding, to go into our neighborhoods and offer partnerships with our neighborhood organizations where students would go to those organizations to actually uh, do some of that work. So, you know, when we think about just, and I think one of the really big ones that I go back to the capital piece because we know the struggles that we've had in the districts with our capital and with our capital improvements that were needed. And so being able to not, not just look at improvements that we would do with HVAC systems or improvements that we would do around um, uh, circulation and those kinds of things, but really building level improvements. We, a couple of years ago, we completed a capital audit and we looked at that time at the monies that were needed to really uh, bring our schools up to standards. So we're continuing to look at that, using that data, and then the updates from where we are now um, as we move forward around the budgeting. If, if there are individuals that are interested in really hearing about it, our sessions are open to anyone. Our next session is on Monday, and the superintendent actually uh, does those sessions, moves through the information, answers questions. Um, and 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 um, provides feedback in terms of our priorities. I think it is important that we 
um, do recognize that we have a district that has a strategic plan um, that is supported by our superintendent and our school board. And the, the financing that we're doing through budgeting aligns to our strategic plan. And so it just allows us to really continue to double down in the areas um, that we know were areas of importance. Ho the whole child commitment, mental health support, looking at our, our capital outlay and capital funding projects, making sure that we're going into neighborhoods and working with students and families, um, that we're looking at mental health supports, that we're looking at you know, what we can do around nursing services, addi additional psychology support, social work support, all of those things. So um, this, is a, this is a great time. The one thing that we also have to connect with, and I know that Randy would reiterate this as well, is because this is one-time money, it is not funds that we can use for recurring revenue. So essentially that means that we would not be able to use this funding per se to um, increase salaries over a, a long period of time because it's one time. So we would expect to see additional bonuses as we work in partnership with, 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 our, with, our, with our unions. We would see additional bonuses because that would be one-time money, but it would not be recurring. So that means we would not yeah. hire um, positions into perpetuity with this fund, with these funds, because we've, we've only, we're only receiving these funds for a finite amount of time. I think that's a that's an important clarification. A uh, lot of follow up questions to what you shared, uh, Randy. Uh, you have the benefit of kind of being at, at two levels. One is that uh, that entity that helps to move whatever may be the agendas that are established by the legislators and MDE. But I dare say you've always had a vision yourself for what you think is an equitable uh, educational system here for the state of Michigan. Um, and the fact that, as Ironetta said, unprecedented amount of funds that have come into uh, not only Michigan, but across the country. From your standpoint, what do you think are some of the important things? What's your vision for how the American Rescue Act can uh, help improve uh, and have more equity in our system um, in Wayne County? Yeah, well, we've been pushing for a more equitable school funding system now mm -hmm. for the last several years. And I've done presentations uh, uh, at Infinitum in regards to what that can look like. We know what it needs to look like. And that is we've actually identified by research the types of resources that we need to have in place in order for all students to be successful. And so that really requires us to spend the most money on the students that have the highest need. And so we actually have a system that we've developed that would redo the school funding system here in the state of Michigan to do exactly that. And so these ESSERS funds, as we call them, that are coming into local school districts, really for the first time starts to look at funding the needs of the student as opposed to any other way. And so that's a, a great first step. I would highlight uh, what Ironetta shared, and that is these are funds that are only here for a short period of time. And so we still need to fix the underlying school funding system here in the state of Michigan to address the needs of all students and to redo our finance system to make sure that all students are getting the resources that they need to be successful. And so, you know, our research said that, you know, our students that are at risk should be getting about $13,000 per student. And the average student across the state of Michigan ought to be getting about $10,000 per student, which not only is more than we're getting right now, but it really flips the system in regards to mm -hmm. getting the resources to those students who need it the most. And so the Recovery Act actually takes those, you know, is the first step in doing that. It actually allocates the money to the students that have the highest need. And so we're excited about that. Um, as Ironetta shared, again, these are uh, monies that are only going to be available for a few years. And so school districts are planning based on that. And uh, as Ironetta mentioned, they're going to be spending the money on one-time expenditures over the next few years because they know that money won't be there after that. And so facilities as just one item is a great way for school districts to try to create some equity in our schools with these one-time dollars. And one of the biggest inequities in the state of Michigan is that if you're in a community that has a very high tax base, you have money to fix up your buildings and make sure that they are state of the art for your children. 
in school systems that have a lower property tax base, they had the least amount of money to address those facility needs, which research shows very clearly help to have students be successful in school. And so in my opinion, this is a once in a generation opportunity for school systems to actually do some catch up when it comes to their facilities to be more equitable uh, with their neighbors across the state of Michigan. I know that DPSCD right here in Detroit is spending a significant amount of time looking at that, which in my mind is really, really smart. And I just want to also commend the Detroit school system here because the process that they're using to utilize their ESSERS funds, and Ironetta shared you know, those engagement meetings that are occurring. From what we've seen, it's probably the most comprehensive process to get feedback from their local community that I've seen in any community. And so hats off to them for really reaching out to try to get feedback from parents and from community members on what the needs are uh, uh, to, to spend these dollars. It's the most comprehensive uh, plan that I've seen right here in the city. Uh, well, that's awesome. Uh, Ironetta, I know that's great news to hear from you uh, and, and to hear from Randy to the work that you and Dr. Vitti are doing. A couple follow-up questions. Uh, we've talked a great deal about capital improvement and absolutely the house that you live in, the school that you go to, the way it looks, it's built, the technology, addressing the, the perpetuity of the digital divide. Uh, we're, we're glad to see all of these are opportunities through this funding. Can you give some ballpark figures? Um, Ironetta and, and also you know, Randy, we talked about capital improvements, uh, the buildings. We've talked about the social, emotional and ongoing health needs of our children. Because if we're not healthy, we're not learning. If we're not learning, we can't achieve. If we're not achieving, we're certainly not gonna be part of the workforce. But could you give some ballpark numbers as you've looked at your budget? How much are you looking at in terms of capital improvement? How much are you looking at uh, being set aside to help with um, not only social emotional supports with the schools, but with the partnerships, the, um, the community-based organizations? So that's like three buckets I gave you. Can you give some ballpark numbers around that? I think what I'm going to do is I am going to let Randy go first and I'm going to do better than ballpark because we've just had our conversation with our finance committee. And so I'm actually going to pull up the, it's, it's already online, it's live on our site, but right. I am going to pull up our actual budgeted numbers that have already been shared with our finance committee. So Excellent. I'll let Randy start and that'll allow me to give precise numbers versus just an estimate. Wonderful, Arnetta. All right, Randy's in your court. Well, and, and Jametta, you did a really nice job of sort of outlining where the buckets are. And so really school districts are looking at, with, with these ESSERS dollars, facility improvements. They're looking at learning loss or learning mm -hmm. recovery efforts, which are the wraparound services, the support for kids, and the additional learning time to help them get caught up uh, for any learning loss that they've had over the last uh, a, a year. And then last, there are ongoing, you know, uh, COVID related costs with, uh, you know, cleaning and PPE mm -hmm. equipment, et cetera, that are, that are still there. So I would identify those three buckets and it really varies from school system to school system sure. based on number one, the condition of their facilities as they are right now, but also the amount of money that they're getting. And again, these ESSERS dollars are really being uh, distributed in a much more equitable way. So our poorest communities are seeing the largest amount of resources coming in. And so they're probably gonna be doing more work with facilities than maybe a school district that's getting a little less. Mm -hmm. And they're gonna be focusing on their learning recovery uh, uh, efforts because that's about a, amount of, you know, that's where, uh, uh, you know, about, a, about how much money they're getting mm -hmm. coming into their school system. So it really is um, uh, different for every school system in regards to how much they have coming in and what their, what their needs are. Thank you. Uh, just a quickie question with that. So if you were to, if you were to hazard in, in Wayne County, obviously we, we've got Detroit, which is the biggest, but you know, we go anywhere from, you know, Wyandotte, Inkster, Dearborn Heights, et cetera. Um, for those who are not aware, how many school districts are there in the Wayne County system? 33 school systems in Wayne County and uh, about 100 uh, PSAs, uh, public charter, uh, public uh, school academies. 
And, uh, you know, we vary. I mean, there's no diversity like there is in here in Wayne County. So <laughs> yeah. we've got some of the most affluent communities. We've got some of the poorest communities. We've got some of the largest school districts, including Detroit, Dearborn, Plymouth, Canton, Livonia. We've got small school systems like Westwood and yeah. Eforce. Uh, mm -hmm. We have literally, if you got on a flat rock, 4-H programs and farms. And of course, we have urban areas here in, in Wayne County. So we've got a little bit of everything within those 33 school systems. Okay, great. You also mentioned, uh, so uh, DPSED has the lion's share of our, of our children in, in Detroit, but we also have children that are enrolled in the charters. Um, is that same formula of requiring funds to be spent on children with the highest needs, is that same formula applied to charters as well? That is correct. So the allocation to any school entity, whether you're a charter school or a public school, is based on the students that are in your school district and the needs that they have. Great. And so Ironetta is going to provide us with these details. Ironetta, also, if I could, uh, families, I want to invite you. Um, Ironetta has put in the chat. Uh, so for those who want to uh, please be engaged with Dr. Vitti, he needs to hear your voices. And that also means community-based organizations, that information is there. Summer programming information is there. So we wanna encourage you to please uh, check out our chat. And now we're, we're gonna hear the numbers. Ironetta, yeah. thank you, go ahead. So, so one of the things that I did want to orient everyone to, I gave, and thank you, Jametta, for sharing that um, information on our district's website um, for um, accessing our engagement sessions. But as you go to that site, you also have full access to all of our board documents, which means it includes any meetings that we have. The information that's covered in those meetings is a part of uh, the chronicle within board docs. And so one of those recently was our finance committee meeting, which was last week. We had academic committee and finance committee last week. And so in the board docs system, if you go to that meeting, or the upcoming board meeting that's on Tuesday, the documents will be there as well. It will give you an opportunity to see the actual documents and the presentation. So when we think about, as you go through all of those, because there are many different uh, budgets that we look at, but when we think about what we're providing in terms of nursing support, mental health services, um, the work that we're doing for direct student services, it, it works out to be about $30 million that we're investing just in those types of support. Um, for our um, additional summer programming that we're doing and working with the extended partners. Um, that is a, a right around $2 million that we're investing in that area. And then a much, a much larger amount, it really works to be about 20% 20, 20 that is then invested in our infrastructure and in some areas in terms of the infrastructure. And we're really talking about um, looking at the improvement within buildings and then a greater number that gets us closer to about 45%, if not more, in terms of new facilities, updates that are needed to those facilities, um, the refresh that's needed for technology. I think most people know that last year through a $20 million investment with many of our community partners, we were able to provide technology to all of our students um, at the onset of COVID. However, um, there is the need to refresh and to make sure yeah. that we're able to continue to provide that support to students and, and make sure that they have the necessary technology. So I would definitely encourage anyone that really is really interested in the different areas and what we're looking at spending and how we're spending it to please join our engagement session on Monday or our board meeting that is happening on Tuesday as well. And all of the documents are there for you. So it gives you all of the information right there in front of you. I think the other thing that's important to metaphor us to share is as we were looking at our budget and how we're spending those funds, we're doing the engagement sessions now. And I thank you, Randy, for acknowledging that. But we've also been hearing from our community over the past year over the last two years, you know, really yeah, looking okay. at these mm -hmm. are things and these are areas that have been brought up as things of areas of concern that we needed to focus on. And now we have the finances to be able to bring Finally. some of those gaps. Finally. And so I think this, that, that that's important as well. It's important and it's exciting. How refreshing is it for us to talk about what's been our vision and some of our plans that actually have the dollars now to actually make some of this work? 
But as we know, the, there's a whole nother challenge in implementation. We've actually got a lot more questions. We'd love to have you to come back to talk about the summer programming in particular, how we need to address this issue of attendance, because if we know our babies and our children aren't in school, they're not learning. So we wanna hear more about that and how we can partner with you as community-based organizations to make that happen. So uh, what I'm asking you as always is that we wanna have you come back and talk with us some more. Always willing, just let me Great. know, Great, and, and Randy, Andy, it is, it is not lost on me, and you know that Detroit Parent Network and uh, certainly myself are advocates that we need to look at this from a systemic level. So families, we got to get involved in policy to make sure that our funding for our schools is equitable past this one or two years that we have these funds. So with that, I want to thank both of you and thank you for the, the marvelous job that you're doing, the tough job that you're doing, and know that we're here to support you. Push, pull because we're all about the quality for our kids and families. So with that, uh, families, we are wrapping up on the end of, an, of another really great program. Thank you so much. Have a couple of, of announcements that we wanna share with you. Consistent with what you heard about the American Rescue Plan. These are dollars and opportunities. Mayor Duggan has over $400 million that has come into the city of Detroit and he is making sure and he recognizes that your voices count. So we're going to be inviting the mayor to come and have a listen in to all of you to share what you think is important, how that $400 million should be used to make sure that our children and our families and our seniors are safe and healthy and thriving. We also wanna let you know that there is a community voting tool. What is it that you think is important for not only the funds that the city has, but also uh, that we see coming from the county? We can't forget that we have a county government that is accountable to the citizens. Um, and so 482 Ford has that document, I encourage you. If it's not in our chat, if somebody can pop that in, yes, there it is right now on your screen. Uh, that is a community voting initiative we encourage all of you to use that. We also want to let you know that as we talk about social justice, we have to have justice in the language that we use. And there is a language justice campaign that is going on. We want you to learn more about that 42 Ford Congress of Communities and others are leading that work. And we want to make sure that you're at the table. Uh, we're also really excited, Detroit Parent Network, in partnership with New Paradigm, Detroit Public TV, Community Education Commission, and many more. We are so excited to present the first Parent and Child Early Literacy, Science, and Health Expo. It's next week. So if you have a child between the ages of four and eight years old that loves books and stories, have them dress up in their character. Have them talk about the books that they love. And we wanna make sure that we have the scientists for the future. So we're asking you to please call 313-284-1749 if you would like for your child or your classroom of children from four to eight years old to participate in the virtual fair or in person down at Eastern Market. At Eastern Market, we're going to have the health department will be out there in full force, Wayne Health, great resources and education and career information for children that older. So in other words, it is a family resource fair while we are focused on building up science and building literacy for our children because that's what's going to help our society be better. And speaking about things that are better and powerful, the Charles H. Wright Museum will be celebrating Juneteenth. Uh, Juneteenth, as many of you know, is an important holiday in the experience of America, but African-Americans in particular. Make sure that you come back and learn more with this because we're going to be talking about that. Also, UNI is doing a vaccine drive tomorrow. <laughs> Uh, I love it. We heard Ironetta talk about teens for vaccines. We need our teenagers. We need our 20 year olds. We need our moms. We need to be vaccinated because just like vaccines have helped the world to be safer, it can also help us with COVID to be safer. And last two things, but certainly not uh, least, it is Pride Month and it's Black Music Month. So uh, reach out to people that are in your community. Let's love on each other. Let's sing. Let's dance. Let's celebrate that we have the opportunity to be safe, to be knowledgeable, because that is our power.
And with that, COVID-313 Community Coalition, Jametta Lilly, proud to be part of this wonderful collective and the work of Detroit. Stay strong, stay safe, and be blessed. So team, team COVID-313 Coalition, please, if you would, uh, come on screen because this is really, <laughs> truly, we shouldn't even say it's a group affair. I think we should say it's a family affair, right? I'm going to go old school. You know, we need to be playing some, you know, family affairs, slide and family stones <laughs> music. Um, so I want to thank you, everyone that listens in. Uh, and even people, we, we eat and talk and do our hair in front of each other because we're all about safety.